Are you familiar with the term, the dark night of the soul? That term came into my mind this week, and I did a little research on it, the, the dark night of the soul. Uh, I think we can kind of intuit the meaning of it, but in researching it, I discovered that it originates from 16th century Spain, and uh, a very poor, a very small man who was only four feet, 11 inches tall. He became, though, somewhat of a spiritual giant. His name was John of the Cross, and in his desire to serve the Lord, he became a monk and devoted himself to prayer and serving others. So he was a nurse in a hospital who took care of sick people. He taught poor children how to read. He provided spiritual direction to thousands of people. But, you know, a life of goodness does not exempt a person from suffering. And in his case, the religious leaders of his day were so threatened by his great popularity that they commanded him to stop speaking and teaching, which he could not do, would not do. When he refused, they flogged him. And then when that didn't work, they imprisoned him in a dark six by 10 foot dungeon, feeding him nothing but bread and water for nine months. Um, I think I can understand a little bit of what he meant when he spoke of the dark night of the soul. Like Job, he refused though to curse God and die. And even not getting a lot of answers from the Lord as to why God allowed that to happen to him, his faith held and was even stronger when he got out than it was before. So when I read that, I couldn't help thinking of God's promise. Some of you probably know this. In Isaiah 45.3, I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. That just seems like an impossibility. The riches stored in secret places, the treasures of darkness. But if you have experienced anything like a dark night of the soul, then you know those treasures that God has given you at the bottom of everything being held secure by the Lord. And I thought of Paul this week in his dark night of the soul and Job before him and so many of the psalmists what a blessing they have been to us when we go back in our hard struggles and we read the rawness of their words and yet their faith. And they're, they're finding God sufficient in the things that they went through. It's a balm to our hearts when we read those words. This is not an easy passage to teach, this passage on suffering and especially because I know some of you have lived through darker nights of the soul than I can imagine going through. And some of you may be in one of those right now. But God knows. And Paul had a pretty good idea what your dark night of the soul feels like. At the end of the day, I just pray that these words will be... Um, a ministry to your heart, even beyond the weak vessel who's giving them to you. We're going to look at two divisions, uh, and they're on your sheets. Paul's relationship with Corinth is going to back up just a little bit and look at his history with this city, and then we'll look at Paul's relationship with suffering. So first of all, anybody, anybody here new since Christmas? Do we have anybody new or everybody was here before? Okay, great. Well, just to back up a little bit then, I think it'd be helpful. Um, Paul was a missionary who was sent from a church north of Jerusalem called Antioch. When the early church began, it was in Jerusalem, and most of the people in that church were all Jewish believers because they were Jews in Jerusalem. But God allowed persecution in Jerusalem to scatter believers everywhere. And a big cluster went north to this church in Antioch where it was mostly Gentile territory, and that church just flourished. It flourished so much that there 
burden of their heart was to send the gospel message that had meant so much to them out west to all the lands west of them so that those Gentiles could hear about Jesus too. So they sent Paul. He went on three trips. Different people went with him. But on his second trip, Corinth was one of those cities. Corinth was a city in Greece. And the story of his time there can be read. Luke recorded the whole thing in Acts 18, where he tells about how Paul went from city to city on that second journey, meeting all kinds of opposition. First, receptivity, and then opposition, as people were threatened by his message. The Jews were threatened because it seemed to undermine what they were trying to teach, and they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. The Gentiles were threatened because this was going to turn lives upside down and take them out of all the things that went along with their pagan worship. So Paul had a rough time. Um, when he went to Corinth, he ended up going all by himself. He had been beaten in some places. He had been kicked out of some cities. He had been smuggled out of some cities. He had been laughed at. He had been ignored. And he writes, uh, when he got to Corinth in his first letter, he writes that he arrived in fear and trembling. He was all alone. And his livelihood was making tents, so that's where he started. But it was a really rough time. Um, he started in Corinth in the synagogue. He reasoned with them. It's what he always did. He went to the place where people already knew about the God of the Old Testament, and he started there. And then he reasoned with, him, with them using the scriptures, showing them how Jesus was the Messiah foretold in the Old Testament until the day came, and it always came, where they kicked him out. This time, when they kicked him out, the synagogue ruler left with him because the synagogue ruler had become a believer in Jesus, and his whole family had become believers. And you know what they did? Only God could write this story. They just set up shop next door to the synagogue, and Paul kept right on teaching. Uh, but it was a hard time. Paul refers to his hardships himself, and then Luke gives us the story in Acts 18, which I just want to read you because it kind of makes me think of this other time when the Lord helped Paul in his suffering. It says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision as he was so downcast in Corinth, so weak. He said, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you. No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. It made me think of Elijah thinking, it's only me. And God says, no, nah, there's still 5,000 around here who haven't bent the knee to Baal. Paul was thinking he was the only one. And God said, no, nah, you're not the only one. I've got many people in this city. You keep after it. And Paul stayed another year and a half. Um, Corinth was what we'd call a hot mess. <laughs> it was a port city, lots of sailors going in and out, lots of sexual immorality, pagan temples everywhere. One of them had a thousand prostitutes. You can guess how popular the worship there was with the sailors. Uh, it was a boom town, rowdy. And oddly, it almost doesn't fit, is this background of Greek wisdom and philosophy that just kind of moved into the church with all this, it's just a toxic mess. They were competitive, they were divisive. You've heard some of this, and those who went through it last semester, it just sounds like, it felt like the same old thing every time we opened our Bibles. Um, but also a, a sense of superiority over Paul. Nevertheless, Paul considered himself the spiritual father of these people. He was the one who had first gone there and shared the gospel and established those little house churches. He loved them. He agonized over them. He persevered to teach them, to correct them, to explain to them about Christ and about themselves and sometimes about him. Um, what I wanted you to see was just this little chart that I made that gives a little bit of the flow of things. And you can appreciate my high tech here with the drawn on arrows. <laughs> Paul wrote the first letter after he got news of lots of problems in the church. And he had even gotten, apparently, a letter from the church with questions. 
then he made a painful visit after that that we don't know really a lot of details about, but we know that it happened because he refers to it in this letter. He followed that visit with another letter that we don't have. We think he wrote a letter because what he refers to in this book is a painful letter, a severe letter that he says he doesn't regret sending, but it was very hard to send. He sent it with his friend Titus, and then he just bit his fingernails waiting to hear back from Titus. How did they respond to my letter? Um, then we know he suffered this deadly peril that he tells us about this week. Then apparently Titus got back, and the news was good about the response to the letter. And again, we know that because of what he says in this book about it. But apparently he got more bad news. It's just like a roller coaster with this church. These men that Paul is going to call in this book super apostles. He calls them that facetiously because they seem to act like they're so high and mighty and greater than Paul. And there are a lot of problems that they bring in that this book is going to work to address. So Paul wrote 2 Corinthians, another long letter, another scroll. It was all rolled up in a tube that he's addressing these problems. Why is it important for you to know all that? Yeah, I've wondered that myself if I, as I was struggling to make that chart and trying to put all the different commentaries and everything together. Well, it's important because it helps you understand and appreciate Paul. Wow, the tenacity of this man. And behind him, the tenacity and love of God who cares for hot messes and won't leave them to just stew in all their problems. And secondly, it helps us understand the context of some of the, the passages that we're going to be looking at this semester. I'm just going to tell you, some of these passages are so wonderful. You probably know a lot of them because they get pulled out and they get given to us as encouragement. But the beauty of our study is that you're going to get to see them in context. You're going to understand why Paul wrote these words to the original people he wrote them to, and that's going to make them even richer before we pull them out and apply them to our own lives. What I notice most in comparing the two letters, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, that we have is that 1st Corinthians was mostly corrective. It felt like deja vu all over again. Every time we'd open our Bibles on a given week, it was Paul correcting them about something. And it was often the same things. This letter, while it is corrective in a sense, yes, it is consoling. It is a letter of consolation, and it just is a balm to our heart. Every commentary has noted Paul's transparency in this letter. And I mean, it's going to almost be embarrassing sometimes how he opens up his heart to these people. Um, two big themes in it. You've discovered them this week. Suffering and comfort. Suffering and comfort. So the principle is God's heart is always easiest seen in those most aware of the grace they've been given. God's heart is always easiest seen in those most aware of the grace they've been given. And I bet you could testify to that too. Um, Paul never forgot God's grace to him. He always remembered where he came from and God's goodness to him. And it changed everything about the way he ministered, the way he loved, and was tenacious in that love with other people. Of himself, here's what Paul says. 1 Timothy 1.15, I am the worst of sinners. 1 Corinthians 15.9, I am the least of all the apostles. Ephesians 3.8, I am less than the least of all God's people. Does that not touch your heart about this man, his humility? Have you experienced God's gracious love to you? Paul knew who he was before God saved him. He never forgot it. God's love and grace changed him forever, and he was able to extend that to others and not give up. 
on other people. I, I thought as I was writing this at that praise song, it's an old one, so probably only if you're my vintage would you remember it, but <laughs> God's love never gives up, never gives up, never gives up. God's love never gives up on me. That's something you can hold on to. Paul shows us that in this letter. And where has God given you that kind of love for somebody else? Maybe sometimes you think they don't even deserve it, but God's love is beating in your heart for them, and you continue to love them and pray them and pray for them and speak truth to them. In the second section, Paul's relationship with suffering, when I did my homiletics, it was ridiculous. I know Kim has taught us to do homiletics, and you're just looking for the key words, and you, you make it real short as you're going through and noting what you find in all the verses, and my homiletics were the exact verses, because every single word was so rich and so deep. Um, in verse 1, in 2 Corinthians 1, and if you don't have your Bible set, then it probably would be helpful to read it or read it on your sheet that you have. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all the saints throughout Achaia. Achaia is just that area in Greece. Um, first of all, you look at what he says about an apostle of Christ. Christ by the will of God, that's a direct correction to the people who were dismissing his claim to be an apostle. Paul said, I can say this not because I'm claiming it, not because I'm bragging, not because I put myself on some kind of pedestal. God made me an apostle. God gave me this authority. Um, Luke records in Acts three separate readings of Paul's testimony, how God came into his life when he didn't deserve it. He was headed to Damascus to persecute Christians, and a blinding light came from heaven, knocked him to the ground, a voice from heaven. He couldn't see. He was in the dark for days. He had been self-righteous. He had been sure he had the answers, and suddenly he's knocked to the ground and knows he has no answers. A disciple named Ananias was sent to remove his blindness and commission him into God's service. And the exact words here, and I think this is worth me just reading this to you, Acts 9, 15 to 16. God said to Ananias, who was shaking in his boots, no, you want me to go to this guy? He may kill me. God said, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Doesn't that play for today's lesson? And note too here that Paul doesn't say just to the church in Corinth. He says to the church of God in Corinth. They are God's church. He calls them saints which is not a word that means stained glass window people. <laughs> that word in the Bible, saints, that means people who have been separated by God because he calls them his own. They belong to him. He has called them out of the world in a sense and to himself. So they are separate in their destinies, their eternal destinies. They're separate and their focus in life, and they're separate in the way they are to live life. That's us, separate in all those ways. He says in verse 2, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you marvel that after all he's been through with this church, he can say, Grace and peace to you. That's amazing. Grace is God's unearned and undeserved goodness. It's a gift that we do not boast. It's his grace that we are even able to have faith to come to him, even that our eyes are open to the gospel, even that we would want to come to him. Because other verses tell us no one was righteous, not one person on the face of the earth, but God. God made a difference. The Bible invites everybody, come all who will, but only God 
can jiggle the willer. Only God. He jiggles our willers that we will come to him. Uh, every single letter of Paul's begins and ends with the word grace because Paul never forgot how God used grace in his life. Peace here is not shalom. Shalom is a Jewish word that's kind of a general peace, and you know, you can have peace just because everything's going okay today, right? But the peace here, the specific word, is the kind of peace that can only come to us from God. And it comes to us because we have a relationship with Him. It comes to us because we are able, in a very supernatural way, when nothing around us would indicate it. It enables us to trust in the sovereignty and goodness of God. You have felt it, haven't you? In times when it was anything but peaceful, and suddenly this supernatural peace just envelops you. That is the peace God is, Paul is talking about here. In verse 3, he says, getting to the main point, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Now we're getting to the heart of it. He is not just the God of comfort. He is the God of all comfort. All comfort comes from him. And zero in on that word compassion. Compassion is one of God's favorite and most cited words of revelation of himself to us. And it is no surprise that when Moses comes to God and asks, show me yourself, God puts Moses in the cleft in the rock because nobody can see God and live. And as God passes by, he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. Now, God could have shown Moses a million things about himself. He chose one. The most important thing that God wanted to show Moses was that he was compassionate. He was gracious. We would do well to remember that. God comforts us in all our troubles, verse 4 goes on, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And note the flow there, because Paul just keeps going back to this amazing continuum, this truth that just goes around in a circle. Comfort is repeated in this section nine times, hardships or words about hardships seven times. So if you're keeping score, it's seven to nine and comfort wins. <laughs> this week's questions pointed out, I love that, the word comfort, what it means. Um, the Latin word com means with and fort, like fortitude, um, with strength. Comfort isn't just patting somebody on the head, giving them a lollipop distracting them. Comfort is coming alongside the strength. And that is exactly the same word that we have in the Greek when John is talking about the Holy Spirit. You look those verses up. Holy Spirit's name in that section, paraclete, it's the exact same meaning, para, alongside. And I guess clete means strength. I didn't look it up, but it's the same word, paraclete, alongside with strength strength to help us get through whatever it is. Paul's point is that Christians will suffer. It's not an if, it's a when. But with the Holy Spirit with us, alongside us, and in us, we have the strength to walk through those times. How does he do that? Well, so many ways. But one of the chief ways, and John alludes to it, is bringing Scripture to mind, helping us remember the words that have been given to us. In my life, that has absolutely been it, which is just such a, a plea, I think, for studying hard, getting into the words, letting them lodge in your mind, memorizing them. Sometimes my memorizing hasn't been so much because I set out to memorize them, but because I was holding on to them for dear life. And as I just continued to hold on to those words, they just imprinted in my mind. I could see them on the page. And God would just 
flash them into my mind in a time when I needed them. I'm not kidding. It was amazing. When I couldn't have even opened my Bible and I couldn't have found it, and there it was right there when I needed it. But he also uses faithfulness of friends, doesn't he, to come alongside. He does what only God can do through the people of God. They do what God has called them to do. What the people of God do, they come alongside and they strengthen. And then there comes a day when it's our turn to come alongside somebody else. So Paul says, watch for it. Watch for it. As the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also, also through Christ, our comfort overflows. Just a loop. You think of it like a cup. It's just draining out. The suffering's coming in, and you're everything. It's just draining out. And then Paul's comfort, God's comfort, overflows into that cup. It just overflows. It takes over all the space that the suffering occupied, and then it overflows to other people. It's so beautiful. The question in verse 5 that we hit about the sufferings of Christ was one to think about, and I'm not sure that I have the answer to that. I think there are a lot of answers maybe to that, but I know what it can't be. It can't be the suffering of Christ on the cross for our sins. We cannot enter into that. It has been done for us. It, at a point in history when Christ was on the cross suffering for the sins that we committed against him, it was done. He said, it's finished. We cannot go back and add to that, not by any good deeds. We only accept it. We can't add to that any more than we could go to Germany today and fight against Hitler and defeat him. That has already been done. It was a historical event that happened. We accept it. But so what is it? I think that it is the struggle to hold on to our faith, to endure in our faith, and to push our faith out where others need it. And I, I looked at Christ in the desert wilderness when the enemy came to tempt him, and the struggle, the suffering of holding on to the faith in a time when he was physically weak, but he did it. And then you think of the suffering that he went through in pushing the gospel out, and you think of the suffering that it was in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed and drops of blood actually came out like sweat, stealing himself in his trust in the Father and his determination to obey the Father. I think we can experience some of that, yes. By his grace, we get to experience some of that. But the main point is that his comfort is able to flow into us and then out of us into the lives of other people. Paul's final wrap up, verses six and seven, verse six and seven, he says, if we're distressed, that means he was distressed. If we're distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer and our hope for you is firm. Paul firmly believes that these people are going to walk through the faith and have the same strength and ability that God gave him because God will give it to them. Because he knows that just as they share in his sufferings, they will share in the same comfort he shared. That is such an amazing thing that his hope in them is firm. Um, principle. God comes alongside us in our sufferings and uses us to come alongside others. God comes alongside us in our sufferings and uses us to come alongside others. Without elaborating, I have been through sometimes, not like Paul is talking about here, where things conspired in my life, hit my life in such a way that I truly did feel like one lady in this class described it as kind of falling into a black hole. It was pretty, pretty awful. And I think one of the worst things about it was just it, it was so shocking. I wasn't a young baby believer. I had been around the block. I'd been teaching Bible study. I was in my 40s, and boy, is that advertising. 
for why the 40s. <laughs> 40s are not easy years, I'm just going to tell you. But it was shocking to me because it just knocked me to the ground. I, I just couldn't quite pick myself back up again. Um, but God, week by week, gave me what I needed through friends, through scripture. But it was kind of like when you've been really sick, and you can't eat a real full heavy meal right at once and you just have to take little tiny bites along until you're able to get strong enough for more. It was like the widow of Zarephath when she went every day to get the, you know, the jars of flour and oil and every day she reached into those jars that should have been empty and every day she pulled out enough flour and oil for that day for herself and the others that she needed to feed. And that's what it was like for almost a year. It was amazing. What I just want to say to you is, if you're in one of those times, or if someday you find yourself in one of those times, God can and He will do that for you. He will come alongside and He will give you the strength. And He may not rescue you from it, but he will give you what you need to walk through it. And at the very worst case scenario, maybe the deliverance is just going to be going to be with him, which, you know, is that the baddest, the worst thing? No, it's not the baddest thing at all. Um, so Paul even considered that in his own deadly peril, that that might be where he was headed in verses 8 to 11. When he says, do not, I don't want you to be uninformed about the hardships we suffered we were under great pressure. All these words indicate the, the words apparently in the original Greek, just intense pressure, just crushing, crushing pressure where you feel like you can't breathe. It's more than you can endure, he said, far beyond our ability. We despaired of life. We felt it was the sentence of death. That's the editorial we. In other words, Paul was feeling like it's the sentence of death. Um, that was his dark night of the soul or one of them um, and then the capstone of it he says so we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead I can testify that when you get into one of those places the first thing you realize is that you can't do one thing to get yourself out of it and I think that's a good thing because I do think we probably tend to think that we can handle some stuff. Sure, we can handle stuff until the really bad stuff comes along and we realize how absolutely helpless and inadequate we are. And that is where we turn to God as never before. And I think that is part of the whole deal. Paul says he's delivered us from deadly peril. He will deliver us. And he will continue to deliver us. I love that. He did it in the past. He will do it now. He will do it. He will continue to do it. You can take that to the bank. You can set your hope. Paul says, on him we have set our hope. You put your stake in the ground. You hammered that stake in. No matter how you're feeling, you set your hope on God because he will not let you down. Um, the last point, and a big one, a key theme to this whole section, is this part on prayer where Paul says, you helped us by your prayers. They didn't know it when they were praying for Paul. They didn't know what he was going through. They just were praying for Paul. He said, God's gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. God has designed his spiritual universe in such a way that even when you can't be anywhere near the person who's going through a hard, hard time, you may not even know all the particulars of that hard time. You can't do one blasted thing to help them, but you can pray. And prayer is powerful. It does things. There was a study, not by a religious institution, but by Stanford University some years back on prayer. 
they divided a group of patients into two groups. One group they had people praying for, just strangers, praying for these people. Second group, the blind group, nobody playing, praying. And at the end of a certain period of time, they looked at the status of the two groups of patients. The group of patients who had been prayed for, are you shocked? We shouldn't be. That group of patients showed marked improvement, and the other group didn't. There is no way to explain that. God answers prayer. Um, the principle here is God never intended for us to rely on ourselves. We need him and we need others. We are not meant to rely on ourselves. We aren't supposed to be shouldering all this stuff, trooping on, soldiering on. We are supposed to be transparent enough to let other people know what our needs are, how they can minister. Paul has said so much about the body, you know, in that whole section about the spiritual gifts. We are a body. We need each other. And part of that is letting people know what your needs are so that they can move in and help you. Um, Galatians 6 2 says, Paul writes, carry each other's burdens. I love that verse because the word burdens doesn't just mean mm, little loads, it means the crushing burdens. Later in a few verses, he'll say everybody needs to carry their own load. That means you carry your own regular daily stuff. Sure, everybody needs to be responsible to take care of yourself and your family. But when you get those crushing overloads, those huge burdens, there's where we are to let the people of God step in and help us carry those burdens. And sometimes we can do it by taking meals and handing people scripture verses and whatnot. And sometimes it is by serious on the knees tears, fervent praying. And sometimes I have been blessed to have experienced the sense when I was praying, just a supernatural thing, that God was directing those prayers and powerfully in those prayers, and He was doing something beyond my imagining. And He did. I haven't had a whole lot of those times, but I'm just going to tell you, great, if we're blessed to have those times. We don't always get those times of certainty, but we're still called to pray and to carry other people's burdens with prayer. And I, I just wanted to point you to a sheet that I put, and I don't know if this will mean anything to you, but I talked to a few women in this church, actually in this study, who have carried some of those crushing things. And I asked them, what were some ways that God moved in your life to help you? What, what would you say to somebody who was in a really crushing time? And so the first side just has some quotes from them, some of the things that were meaningful to them. And at the bottom, I just wanted to put this little plug in here for the grief share that Grace is starting Monday, February 21st. If you are bearing a grief that is really hard for you to walk through, consider this, consider this. And then on the back, my dear friend, who has been through some rough times, her own dark night of the soul, compiled a whole bunch of Bible verses. These aren't all of them. She laminated those verses that God gave her in that dark, hard time. And she cuts them into strips, and she hands them to people when they go through hard times. They can be put in a purse. They can be put in a bedside table drawer. This isn't all of them. But I think if you need some encouragement or you know somebody who does, here's a start. Anyway, dark nights of the soul. If you've been in one, if you're in one now, you know just what Paul was talking about. And if you haven't been in one, good. But suffering hits everybody. And you may have one out there somewhere ahead. Just be prepared for when it happens. God has delivered. He 
will deliver. He will continue to deliver. Set your hearts on that truth and hold on to it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these galvanizing words from someone who lived what he is talking about. Lord, we don't hear from somebody who was a stranger to suffering. We hear from somebody who suffered maybe more than we could imagine. And we can take his words to heart. Lord, I pray that you would use us as you promise you will and not waste any of the suffering that we've been through so that we can reach out and help others who need it. In Jesus' name, amen.